But welcome everyone. This is our fifth landmark lecture of our series this year. Um, we're going to be talking about Oak Hill Cemetery with our guest George Hill. Um, a few reminders today. Um, we will be recording, as I just said. And if you have any questions as we go through the presentation, please feel free to drop them into the chat. I'll be monitoring it and we'll have a moderated Q&A after George's presentation. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. And as Katie said, welcome to our fifth program in this year's lecture series. I'm Mark Hudson. I'm the executive director of Tudor Place. And it's my pleasure to introduce George Hill, our speaker this evening. George was born in Washington, DC, where his family has lived for more than 200 years. He attended Landon School for Boys in Bethesda, Maryland before studying philosophy, economics, and arts at Tufts University. After college, he returned to run the family cattle farm in King George County, Virginia. And in 1977, he joined Folger Nolan Fleming Douglas Incorporated and has managed investments for clients ever since then. During the last 30 years, Mr. Hill has also served several organizations, including the Logan Community Association as treasurer, the Washington Area Tennis and Education Foundation as treasurer, the Hillendale Homeowners Association as treasurer and president, Young Audiences of DC, Landon School alumni, and the Smithsonian Institution Libraries. At Oak Hill Cemetery, Mr. Hill acted as treasurer from 2006 until 2012, when he became president of the 501C13, which he was explaining earlier is the uh, type of organization that's the governmental designation for cemeteries, which I did not know. Mr. Hill also resuscitated the dormant Oak Hill Cemetery Historic Preservation Foundation, which is a 501C3 charitable organization, which had been started a dozen years earlier, but which had been inactive. With the prospect of Oak Hill eventually transitioning from an active operating cemetery toward becoming a museum decades from now, it was necessary to begin planning. The cemetery has prudently modeled long range financial projections, begun a systematic program of saving and investing, and tried to balance infrastructure investment, landscape and sculpture rehabilitation and managing expenditures to provide a surplus. The cemetery has also expanded its social presence and increased its community outreach. And this evening, he'll be doing just that, uh, community outreach by sharing with us some of the history of Oak Hill Cemetery and describing a few of its outstanding features. So would you please join me in welcoming George Hill. Thank Hi, you. George, welcome. Thank you, Mark. Um, the history of Oak Hill Cemetery is uh, embedded in the history of garden, rural garden cemeteries in the United States. Um, Oak Hill was founded, uh, chartered by an act of Congress in 1848 and 49. It was not the first rural garden landscape. Um, the, um, Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts was started in 1831. But really the, um, that movement um, started in England or perhaps even in Paris with Père Lachaise. Uh, Père Lachaise was started in 1804, if I have my date correct, by Napoleon Bonaparte. And uh, <clears throat> Paris, like many other cities, was growing. Um, in fact, in Paris, they removed all of the uh, downtown cemeteries and reburied everybody in the catacombs. And I, there are millions of people reburied in the catacombs of Paris. Um, but there was a movement in uh, cities like London. London started seven um, uh, burial uh, uh, sites uh, simultaneously, I believe, in the 1830s, 1840s. Highgate Cemetery is one of those you may have visited to see Karl Marx. Um, and uh, so Paris, London, and then the movement spread to the United States with Mount Auburn in 1831. And it was really a, um, an outgrowth of the um, English landscape garden, um, which were very highly planned, but they were planned to look as though they were very natural and uh, had always been there. And um, Mount Auburn, um, uh, Laurel Hill in Philadelphia, uh, eventually Oak Hill in 1848-1849, were uh, products of that movement. So the necessity was to close uh, church graveyards 
and um, uh, burial plots which were on family farms. The Foxhall family had a burial plot on their on their farm. Many of the uh, many of the um, families that founded Georgetown and Washington uh, had estates, and they buried their uh, deceased on the family farm. Uh, that was it became illegal, it became unsanitary, and it became overcrowded. And so many of the cemeteries, like the Presbyterian Church Cemetery, where Volta Park is now, were consolidated into places like Oak Hill, not just in Washington, but uh, in other cities, as I've said, in Paris, London, Richmond, with uh, the Hollywood Cemetery which was founded sort of in the 1830s, 1840s, but not really used until, heavily used until the Civil War. And so uh, William Wilson Corcoran, uh, his father had made a fortune in the shipping business. William Wilson Corcoran had grown up in Georgetown. He was born, I believe in 1798 in Georgetown. And he used to play on the hills uh, where now are uh, Dumbarton Oaks and perhaps Tudor Place and uh, where Oak Hill is. And he had fond memories of his childhood. In fact, if I might, I will read what he wrote about his childhood. I'm reading from a book that uh, one of our board members uh, put together in the year 2006, Wesley Pippinger. I don't know if you know Wesley, but Wesley has written books, about 20 volumes of, uh, of various cemeteries, mostly in the Washington DC area. And we published a two volume slipcase covered book, which shows uh, probably over 19,000 interments. Uh, Wesley um, transcribed every date, every word on every tombstone and went through our records exhaustively to produce this wonderful volume. <clears throat> this is what William Wilson Corcoran wrote. Uh, I don't have the year in front of me. Without justly incurring the imputation of egotism, I may perhaps be permitted to say that the whole history of my connection with this cemetery from the original establishment to the present hour precludes the supposition that I could advocate the adoption of any course detrimental to its interests. He goes on, its hills were the playgrounds of my childhood, that pure uncalculating season to which in our conflict with the stern realities of life, memory so often and so fondly reverts. So the land on which Oak Hill uh, was, uh, is, um, was owned by the Washington family and uh, some of the early residents of the cemetery, as you know, were the Peter family. And uh, I think the first uh, person uh, buried in the cemetery in 1849 was a Washington uh, young woman. I don't have her name in front of me, I apologize. Um, but we have her name this- name was Eleanor. I'm sorry? Sorry, George, her name was Eleanor Washington. That's correct. Thank you. Yes. Thank, you Laura. Thank you. And so that's why Laura's here to support George. Um, and so um, the Oak Hill Cemetery was a product of this uh, landscape garden cemetery. The, the, the cemeteries previously, um, decades before, had been the products of a puritanical uh, administration that said, you know, life is stern and hell is fire and you should be careful and here's the graveyard and, and, and the new sentiment that, uh, Oak, that uh, inspired Oak Hill and others was it's a beautiful place um, to come and to visit. There are trees, there's the birds, uh, beautiful statuary. Um, it's a place of fond remembrance of our ancestors. And uh, it actually was a place where people came to picnic. So quite a different image than the, uh, than the cemeteries that had uh, preceded it. Um, when William Wilson Corcoran uh, bought the original probably 12, 15 acres, um, he set about improving the grounds. Um, 
cemeteries, mostly, and particularly in Washington, D.C., were not the most beautiful land on which to build a stately house like Tudor Place. They were the areas where you couldn't farm or build a house, and Oak Hill is full of ravines and uneven territory, and um, that presents us with problems of erosion and such. And so William Wilson Corcoran hired George de la Roche, a retired military engineer, to uh, lay out the pathways and the uh, drainage um, which uh, supports Oak Hill. In fact, uh, and George de la Roche was a master engineer, in fact, there are brick uh, vaults which come up from uh, Rock Creek and come up all the way to our street and even beyond our street. And they come up into Evermay and even beyond Evermay, the, uh, the stately house, which is on our Southeast corner. And we provide the drainage system for quite a bit of that area. And one can walk standing in those brick vaults from Rock Creek, probably more than halfway up the hill underground. Uh, there are some of them 10, 15 feet underground, and then they get ever smaller and smaller. You can crawl all the way basically to R Street in those brick vaults. I would say there are probably eight or 10 of them that go from the high point, obviously, down to Rock Creek and drain the land and prevent erosion. Um, they're still in very good shape. They were well built and well engineered. I think De La Roche didn't fight nature. He said, well, which way is the water naturally draining? And then we channeled the water in, in, those, uh, in those directions. And he laid out the pathways. We, we came uh, into possession recently of a beautiful stereoscope done in 1875 or so when uh, the Van Ness Mausoleum was moved from downtown DC to Oak Hill Cemetery. And very few of the uh, plots had been sold in 1875 in that area. And you can see the, the paths and the terraces and the, uh, the landscaping. The, there weren't very many trees at Oak Hill, except maybe perhaps on the ellipse, but uh, most of that area had been clear cut um, I think the rock uh, were, that had been used to build uh, many of the paths and, and structures and such could have been quarried on Oak Hill property itself. Um, and here we are. Um, I am not exactly sure of the year of construction of the gatehouse. It was obviously added on to from time to time, but this is a stereoscope view probably in the 1870s or 1880s when that became popular. And the residence uh, was, is the residence of the superintendent and always has been. Uh, we were fortunate to, uh, recently, we had the retirement of our 13th superintendent, Dave Jackson. And uh, last Monday we have um, uh, received a new superintendent, Paul Williams. Uh, Paul comes to us. He was the uh, president of um, Congressional Cemetery on Capitol Hill for the last, I think, 10 years. And he comes to us with a wealth of knowledge and experience. And I'm really looking forward to having Oak Hill examined with a new set of experienced eyes. Um, uh, Congressional Cemetery, if you know it, is a very successful, very active, very socially um, participatory uh, institution. Uh, I don't think we'll do everything that they do, but um, uh, he's really uh, transitioning very smoothly into becoming the new superintendent. So please come by and say hello to Paul Williams. Um, so here we have the um, gatehouse, which is at 30th and R Street, and you can see the two uh, pillars for the entrance gates. It's probably the, the walk-in gate and maybe to the left there, the, there was a carriage gate probably. <clears throat> you can see some trees right on the ellipse. Uh, I believe at one time there were three dozen oak trees on the ellipse. Now you may know it's a mostly grass structure with some trees on the peripheries. Um, they had some elaborate Victorian type uh, fountains and plants there. 
um, the deer don't let us do quite so much of that anymore. But um, that is the gatehouse and um, it houses both the, the residents and we have uh, a couple of rooms that we use for our office space. It's a little cramped as Laura may know, but um, it has worked and hopefully we can make some improvements with some of our ancillary buildings. Can we see the next slide? So there's a modern view of the gatehouse today. As you can see, it hasn't really changed too much. The bell tower there on the left. Uh, we've restored the ringing of the bell every hour. I, hope, I, I think it stops at a, at a decent hour so it doesn't keep up the neighbors. But um, in the back to the right are some uh, staff buildings. You may not be able to see them completely. Uh, and a two car garage and uh, quarters where our uh, ground screw change and have lunch, et cetera, et cetera. Also um, on the property is um, uh, at the other end of the ellipse from the gatehouse is the Renwick Chapel. So William Wilson Corcoran hired James Renwick to design a small Gothic chapel. It was built in around 1850, 1851, about the same time that the Smithsonian Castle was built, which Renwick also designed. He also designed um, St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City. When he did this chapel, he was probably 30 years old. Um, I, I'm surprised every time I think that William Wilson Corcoran, who was a very successful banker, the son of a successful merchant uh, would have hired a 30 year old, but he did obviously a brilliant job. It's a, just a gem. Um, it is, uh, the, the roof is made of um, Vermont slate, which is sort of a purple color, an ecumenical color, by the way. Um, the chapel was covered in ivy, you can see. It has that rose window which faces west and on the far end, it has a Tiffany-like uh, rose, uh, uh, sorry, not rose window, um, a stained glass window, which uh, is, has a religious motif to it. Oak Hill was always non-denominational, but uh, the chapel is, does have a very uh, heavy religious theme, obviously. We use it for um, some services, both wedding services and funerals. Um, probably just a few uh, of each every year. Here's a contemporary view without the ivy. Uh, we restored the building in uh, 2017, I believe. Inside, uh, on the roof, inside on the inside of the roof are some plaster medallions. And when the, I think it was Wagner, was taking the original roof off to repair the, replace the slates, the plaster medallion started falling like snowflakes. So we, we stopped that pretty quickly, but they found one of the medallions up in the far corner had William Wilson Corcoran's initials. You can't really see it at all, but one of the medallions tucked up in the corner has, has his initials on it. We, we repaired and replaced uh, those uh, broken uh, medallions or, which made her plaster of Paris. Um, the, lamps, uh, the chandeliers in the chapel had been spray painted with sort of a brass paint. Um, it turns out they were made by Caldwell in New York City and they're made of pewter and we had those uh, rewired and, and restored. The chapel is really a gem. You ought, to, you ought to come see it when it's open or we can open it for you. Is there a next slide, please? So on the ellipse are two uh, statues. One is John Howard Payne. Payne was quite an individual. He was uh, an actor, he was a playwright, he wrote music, and then he became the emissary from the United States to uh, Tunis. And he became, I guess as one would call him the ambassador. He died in Tunis and was buried there. He was a friend of William Wilson Corcoran's and Corcoran said, no, 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 no. Um, I'm going to have him disinterred, brought back to Washington DC and interred on the ellipse at Oak Hill Cemetery. He also had a beard originally. I don't know if you can see from the statue, but the beard was removed. I don't think Corcoran liked the beard very much. Um, 
And Payne was known for having, especially known for having written a song called Home Sweet Home. And it, when the Union and Confederate armies would camp for the evening, they would have one camp within earshot of the other and they would play songs. Their bands would, the military bands would play songs. And one of the songs that they played was Home Sweet Home. Uh, not too long after that, the generals forbade the, the playing of Home Sweet Home because they would realize that next morning everyone would have deserted. Uh, may I see the next, I think there's a, another contemporary slide of, of, of John Howard Payne. At the far end of the stat of the ellipse, I guess we don't have a photograph, is Bishop Pinckney. Pinckney was a very uh, powerful bishop in the uh, Episcopal Church, if I remember correctly, um, in Maryland, and he performed John Howard Payne's service. Um, the service, by the way, was attended by the president, the Supreme Court, many, many members of Congress. Supposedly 3,000 carriages came, uh, or 3,000 people and their carriages came to Oak Hill for that funeral service. And John Philip Sousa's band performed. Corcoran is buried in this uh, Greek temple-like structure uh, on the on the south side that's most visible, you see the name of Eustace, which was his wife's family. And on the northern side, you see the Corcoran name. It's really the most prominent uh, uh, hill in uh, uh, promontory in, uh, in Oak Hill Cemetery and looks down on uh, Rock Creek Park. It's a beautiful uh, gem of a sculpture, a sculptured building. And uh, Corcoran is buried in underneath this as are many of his family. Um, it's really very attractive. The Van Ness Mausoleum I told you about, there is the stereoscope on the left in 1875 or so. And you can see very few monuments had been uh, erected uh, at that time. You can see the, uh, the paths and steps and uh, stone steps, etc., that uh, George de la Roche laid out. Also on the property, actually back near some of the Peters in the Northwest, uh, Peter family in the Northwest corner of the cemetery is the Linthicum family mausoleum. The Linthicums were one of the first owners of uh, uh, Dumbarton Oaks. And uh, he was a successful merchant in Georgetown and founded a school for indigent boys, et cetera, et cetera, um, civic minded. And the church is also the same, sorry, the, this mausoleum is also the same red sandstone, uh, probably mined, most probably mined at the um, Seneca quarry where that red sandstone that uh, is the same sandstone that uh, was built to, uh, was used to build the uh, Smithsonian Castle. Uh, that was the quarry that provided the sandstone for the Smithsonian Castle for uh, much of the Renwick Chapel and also for the Linthicum family mausoleum. It's possible uh, that James Renwick designed this mausoleum, but we are not yet able to prove that, but it is the same style. It is in terrible disrepair. That is why we showed you an old picture of it. And hopefully we will be able to uh, restore it uh, soon. Um, here are some of the Peter family uh, gravestones. The two on the right are back there in the far northwest corner of the cemetery uh, above Rock Creek Park. And the several on the left are Armistead Peter, the third and Armistead Jr. And they are just behind the chapel. Um, I have, there are many, many of the Peter family buried at, uh, at Oak Hill. I made a few notes in Wesley Pippinger's book, Armistead Peter the third, who died in 1983 and Caroline Peter, uh, who died in 1965. Uh, Armistead Peter Jr. Um, 
and Martha Custis Kennan. He died in 1960. Helen Tucker Peter, who died in 1995. Um, Alexander Scott Peter, who died in 1807, um, et cetera, et cetera. There are quite a few. I think maybe more than two dozen of the Peter family who are buried at Oak Hill. So originally along R Street was a wooden stockade fence. Um, in approximately 1866, Corcoran paid for a cast iron fence with these granite bases. And if you look on the right, you can see the old bases and the old fence. And we have been restoring uh, several sections um, of the cast iron fence. We take out five sections. We send them to Krug and Sons in Baltimore. They've been doing iron work since 1810 or so, I believe. Uh, Lorton Stone, our contractor, is installing these new granite bases. They only go maybe a few or 18 inches or so below uh, the grade that you can see there because the other granite, the original granite bases that go down several feet are in very good shape. So only need to repair the, uh, replace the uh, upper part of that granite base. But some of the cast iron is in very bad shape from tree limbs falling from cars bumping into it over the years um, and uh, corrosion, salt, rust, etc., etc. So we're doing five sections at a time. We have 80 sections. I think we've done eight. The next five should be reinstalled any day now. They're about $25,000 a section, uh, a total cost of about $2 million, maybe more. Uh, the fence originally cost $6,000. So um, <clears throat> I guess the price of cast iron has gone up quite a bit. And there is our contact information. The fountain you see there is in the center of the ellipse now. It's not original, but it was donated. And uh, the, you can see this is a springtime picture with the uh, tulips in, in the background. So here's our newsletter. You may uh, please feel free to subscribe to it. Laura can help you with that. Uh, go to our website to send us your number, uh, name and number and address and all. Um, we have an article on the restoration of the uh, fence project. We publish this two or three times a year. And uh, we also send out a note from the, this is from the Preservation Foundation. We send one from the Preservation Foundation as well as from the Oak Hill Operating Company. And uh, Mark was asking me about that earlier. So we have the 501C13, which is the operating part of Oak Hill Cemetery. And by operating, we are a, a functioning cemetery. We perform about 50 interments per year. Uh, many of them are casket burials, um, and obviously the rest are cremations, very few scattering. We haven't really gotten into the business of green burials very much, but obviously that is a theme that more and more young people are interested in, more and more people are interested in. Nationally, the uh, trend is towards cremation and not casket burials. Uh, there isn't a lot of real estate at Oak Hill, and so when we do a casket burial, it's not inexpensive. Um, we don't, like some cemeteries, um, we don't ask for a perpetual care endowment. Uh, we do ask that people contribute. Uh, we do ask that people maintain their own uh, plots and stones, but after Many generations as some people and their descendants aren't interested or aren't able or aren't around anymore. And so we really have taken on more and more of the restoration and maintenance of um, gravestones at Oak Hill. Uh, the Linthicum mausoleum, I think, could cost several hundred thousand dollars and uh, <clears throat> we should do it. So it's a beautiful piece of uh, funerary sculpture. Um, 
so we have the 501c13, the operating. And when I came in, uh, as with many other cemeteries, a lot of cemeteries say, well, gosh, we're running out of real estate. We should think about closing up and moving on. We've been very creative at Oak Hill. We have eliminated some redundant pathways. Um, about 10, 15 years ago, we narrowed the road. We have a separate side entrance down on the 28th Street gate. Uh, we narrowed that entrance road and were able to provide some spaces for casket burials. We used those uh, monies to help build uh, columbarium uh, in 2011 down next to um, uh, Rock Creek. That's a very beautiful uh, building, which is designed by our vice president, David DeVeek. David is a retired uh, Navy captain, MIT trained engineer and uh, <clears throat> a genius at uh, designing uh, the improvements necessary to uh, rebuild George De La Roche's drainage to the design of the, of the columbarium, how to repurpose pathways, et cetera, et cetera. And by, by eliminating some redundant pathways, by narrowing the road, we've created a lot of new um, casket burial sites. And um, those are still available. On North Hill, we, it, it, it had been the practice of previous Oak Hill administrations to cover many of the pathways with macadam, uh, asphalt, uh, concrete. And we have been in the business of removing all of that, uh, adding good drainage, uh, tilting the pathways a little bit so that they uh, show the water to the, to the uh, gutter rather than in down the hill to, to produce erosion. And if you go to the North Hill section of Oak Hill now, you'll see what we've been able to do. And there are several dozen uh, casket burial sites and cremation burial sites that are available. And so I think Oak Hill will be in the business of, of uh, burying, um, being a, a community resource for a few decades to come. Uh, along with uh, repurposing those pathways and creating new burial sites, our finances have improved enormously. Uh, we've built up our endowment to a very healthy number. One of the things I did, I'm a finance type, so one of the things I encouraged was we hired an outside financial type who I had uh, come into acquaintance. I didn't want to do that myself. Um, and uh, we instituted a 100 year financial plan. And we're about five years into that and we're ahead of schedule. Uh, one of the things my treasurer, Loretta Cristaldi, who is a very <clears throat> sharp eyed, uh, sharp penciled uh, uh, financial type. Uh, one thing that she and we agreed on was that we would make a contribution to our endowment every year. Uh, we've been blessed with a strong equity market. We've had good risk controls and we've made uh, inflation adjusted contributions now about $250,000 a year. I don't know how many years we can contribute. We can continue to contribute that kind of money because 10 or 15 or 20 years from now, it'll be $500,000. But uh, we're gonna do it as long as we can. And um, it's really put Oak Hill on a very strong financial um, footing. A friend of mine who purchased a casket burial site five or so years ago said, George, is this a good investment? Am I, am I putting my money in a safe place? And I think we can say, yes, we, we are. And we will, we think we can, um, if we continue this plan, we can, we can be in business for another hundred years. How much real estate do we have? And the other issue is maybe the, you have real estate in the far, far corner, but at what cost to develop it? And what can you sell um, the last piece of land for down near Rock Creek? Um, uh, so there will be a cost benefit analysis that needs to be done all the time on, what you have and what you can sell. And when you can't uh, do that anymore, then you have to um, re rely on the charity of others. 
and uh, donations. We don't get much in the way of um, public money from the city or the federal government. We get none. And um, so we really have to operate as a, as a business. Um, I've talked a bit. Any, are there any questions? Um, any other um, subjects? There, there are lots of interesting people uh, buried at Oak Hill. Um, you may wonder why I am the president. Um, I say they couldn't find anybody older. My parents are buried at Oak Hill. My grandparents are buried at Oak Hill. And um, there are one or two generations that are buried over at uh, Holy Rood Cemetery on, uh, on uh, Wisconsin Avenue. But my great 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 grandfather and his wife are buried at Oak Hill. Uriah Forrest was the third mayor of Georgetown. And um, he uh, hosted a dinner for George Washington and was one of the people who helped convince Washington to build the capital city here, mostly because he was a land speculator and owned a lot of land in this area, but also because it was a compromise between having the capital in the North in Philadelphia or New York or in the South in Richmond or Charleston or something like that. So he was, uh, he had lost his leg at the Battle of Brandywine and um, uh, was a confidant of, of George Washington. So interesting history. Um, any, any questions for, for me? Yeah. George, George you, uh, uh, when we were talking before the lecture started, we were talking a bit, and, and you've touched on this, some of the, the future of Oak Hill Cemetery, but this idea of it uh, eventually becoming more of a museum than an active burial ground. Um, can you share with us the, the vision for that and what your, um, what your thoughts are there? Well, I think that's about it right now. Um, we, I, I, don't, I, I don't think we have a need to flesh out that vision anytime soon. Uh, we've got so many pathways that can be rehabilitated that I think we're going to have casket and cremation burials in the ground uh, as long as people, well, for a long time to come. Mm -hmm. Columbarium holds uh, four, has 430 niches or so. And I would say we've probably sold 50 or so. Um, so I think there's a lot of, uh, there, there, there are places one could build another columbarium uh, at Oak Hill, perhaps along the Evermay wall. Um, there are areas where, well, there are some radical ideas that you could build something under the ellipse. Um, I'm, I don't think I'll be doing that in my presidency. Uh, we thought about converting the chapel into a, a chapel and burial uh, site. Um, you know, in Westminster Cathedral, they bury people under the floor. Um, so I think, they're, I think they're creative ideas that perhaps other people can embrace. And, uh, but for the time being, for the next several decades, I think we, we're in a very good, we're in a very good place. So we have the expenses, we need to redo our roads. We need to restore the big low fence. We need to restore the Van S Mausoleum and the Van S family is interested, but that's an expensive project. The Linthicum family are, I don't, I don't they're not around um, and that's an expensive project. Uh, so they're, the, Edwin Stanton's memorial, um, one of the people buried at, at uh, Oak Hill Cemetery is Lincoln's Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton. And, Re repairing and restoring uh, those large obelisks is um, financially challenging, shall we say. You can see that it costs $6,000 to build the Bigelow Iron Fence and $2 million to repair it. So um, we will transition again, uh, into a, a museum at some point, um, but I think it's a few decades away and I, that's about as far as, as I've gotten in terms of thinking about a solution to that. Great, thank you. So we do have a couple of questions in our chat right now, one of which is when did the mausolea start to be built and what are the oldest um, at Oak Hill? Well, there were a series of mausolea built uh, in the 1960s. Um, 
down near the carriage house. The carriage house is a structure, an octagonal structure overlooking uh, Rock Creek, where we house our maintenance equipment. Uh, we don't have a lot. We've got a truck and some gators, John Deere gators, and obviously mowing equipment, some burial equipment, um, storage of materials, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it's a two-story structure, uh, handsome structure. There was a receiving vault um, located. Uh, I don't know how to describe it? Um, most of the way down to Rock Creek. And the Basil family came to us in the 1960s, as I understand it, and said, we would like to build a mausoleum, a cave type mausoleum here where the receiving vault is, and we will build you the carriage house in exchange. Um, a very generous offer, shall I say. And uh, they had to have an international construction company and they knew how to build carriage houses very very well, and uh, they put a lot of time and effort and uh, ability into building that structure, and they built a beautiful, beautiful mausoleum for their family. Um, then several others, the Alfandre family, the Wheeler family, um, the Selen family, uh, built uh, four or five, six mausoleum there, mausolea there. There is a large uh, oak tree, between the last mausoleum and the carriage house. And when that oak tree decides to depart um, and not before, we may have the opportunity to build another mausoleum down there. Um, in 2010, the previous board, I was the president and I and the previous superintendent decided that we could build a series of mausoleum on the back of Cross Avenue. Uh, that is the road which runs on the back side, the north side of the ellipse. And uh, <clears throat> we built a mausoleum there in, on speculation, so to speak. We didn't have anyone, there was no one's name on it. We built it, we designed it, and uh, it was installed as a, a test. Um, a, gentleman, a friend of the cemetery, learned from his late wife's sister that she never wanted to be buried underground and he had her removed to that mausoleum. And uh, we sold it and we thought what a, what a good idea. And we planned a series of, of 10, eight, 10 uh, mausolea site there on the back of the ellipse. And we got some pushback. People said, oh, well, you shouldn't have built the, you know, it changes the, the view. Yes, um, it uh, changes the ellipse. The, the ellipse has changed more times than, than you can imagine. As I said, there were three dozen large oak trees where the ellipse is now. Um, it wasn't a grass area. There was a fountain, there wasn't a fountain. The fountain has been moved. John Howard Payne's statue was installed in the 1880s. Bishop Pinckney's, who presided at his funeral, died three weeks after uh, John Howard Payne's uh, funeral. He probably caught a cold or something at the funeral. Um, but Pinckney's statue was installed in the 1880s. So the ellipse has changed quite a bit. And um, we thought, the board thought, I think, I still think that um, building mausolea there is very appropriate. Um, if you, and financially necessary for the cemetery to survive. Um, if you go to Passy Cemetery in Paris or Père Lachaise, or Montparnasse or any of the great cemeteries in England, they build mausolea cheek by jowl. Um, they, they don't have any room between them. They, they're, well, I won't make any inappropriate descriptions of them, but they're square little, uh, no, they're very handsome, but uh, squarish, uh, tall um, structures with beautiful bronze doors and stained glass windows, but there's sometimes inches between uh, the different mausoleum. Um, if you walk into Passy Cemetery in Paris, 
you sort of are overwhelmed by the size of these mausoleums on the, in the entrance road. So I don't think that's going to happen to Oak Hill. Uh, I think it, the layout was to put eight or 10 mausoleum site on the back of, of, um, of uh, the ellipse on Cross Avenue. The second one was for Ben Bradley. Um, and we oriented that one so that the entrance was on the ellipse and not onto Cross Avenue as the first one was. Some people thought that was inappropriate and um, maybe, maybe. Um, I think it's a beautiful mausoleum that was designed by a very talented architect and is a beautiful structure. Um, since then, we have sold two or three others and we'll probably start construction at some point. Um, there are also uh, a gentleman um, didn't want to build a mausoleum, and, but he wanted a, a structure. And so there's a bench-like structure in place of a mausoleum uh, on Cross Avenue today. Um, we believe we're in negotiations. Um, we're beyond that um, with uh, a very talented local architect who wants to put a sculpture on uh, his uh, mausoleum site, which I think will be... Um, quite attractive and um, will not be a mausoleum. So people have the option of, of doing different things uh, on Cross Avenue. There are other opportunities around the cemetery where you could build cave mausolea into the hillsides um, back where the um, uh, Peter family uh, that I mentioned in the far northwest corner, there's a little plot of land, one could build a mausoleum there. Uh, we recently had a family build, uh, the Biddle family built a mausoleum down on Davidson Circle, which is pretty close to Rock Creek, overlooking Rock Creek. It's a very handsome um, structure that was built by a company called Rock of Ages. Uh, the, the, mar oh, sorry, the granite came from Barry, Vermont, and is the finest quality stone and finest quality builder of mausoleum in the world. And so uh, come and visit and look at the, uh, the middle mausoleum, which has beautiful bronze doors and a, a, a very lovely stained glass window. So we're still um, finishing up the touches around it. We're gonna put a stone path in front of it, the marble just came yesterday, I believe. Oh, sorry, the granite just came yesterday for the pathway. So by rebuilding the pathways and um, repurposing them, some will be stone, some are stone, some will be grass. Uh, we will have burial, many, many, many burial options and opportunities for decades to come. That actually kind of leads me uh, to a follow-up question. So people have been buried at Oak Hill for over 150 years, is there any sort of dominant architectural style or commemorative style of, of the statues or the markers or the mausoleum that are on Oak Hill? Or are they very like different because it's been through different eras? Well, there are many obelisks. Um, I think there are 200 obelisks, um, which is a style that we don't really see a lot of today, I wish, wish we did. Um, there are some table stones, some tablet markers. Uh, one thing I did uh, encourage the cemetery to do um, uh, was to restore the, uh, the Key family tablets. Uh, Philip Barton Key, an ancestor of mine, and his wife, Rebecca Plater, were, um, he was, they were the uncles, uh, the aunt and uncle of uh, Francis Scott Key. And uh, Philip Barton Key was an attorney in town and um, yeah, is buried uh, not too far from the Biddle Mausoleum. And there's a, a tablet stone, um, which is uh, very moving. Um, let's see if I can find the inscription for, oh yes, I have it here. So I encouraged the, uh, the tablets were broken and I encouraged, uh, I encouraged the cemetery to restore those. And um, here lies the body of Philip Barton Key, 
who died July the 28th, 1815, in the 58th year of his age. If nature's richest gifts could ever bribe, if genius, wit, and eloquence could charm, if grief of sorrowing friends or anguish wild that wrings the widow's and the orphan's heart could avert death, the uplighted stroke long had this victim of his wrath been spared. Mourning survivors, let all care give place to that great care most demands your thoughts. The care that brings the troubled soul to Christ. High your hopes there is beyond the grave, a life of bliss where death shall never more. You shall from joys that know no, that know or bound nor bind. So um, some of those um, inscriptions are a bit illegible. So the translation is a, a bit uh, garbled and in, in, garbled in some places, but um, so I'm sorry, I, I got diverted from your question. Put me back on track, please. We were, we were talking about the different architectural styles or commemorative styles, but I think I think that did answer most of the question. Well, uh, I, there is a very large obelisk at the cemetery, the Orm obelisk, you can see it from R Street. Um, the thing must be 40 or 50 feet tall, made of granite. Um, I just don't understand how you could have erected such a thing with horses and cables and no mechanical tools. Um, so people don't, um, people have not invested in uh, such monuments since the 1880s, 90s, turn of the century. Um, we encourage people to do, um, as I said, this architect is going to produce a beautiful sculpture for his uh, plot. Uh, there is another family in Washington whose husband lost his wife and he's hired um, um, a sculptor in England, uh, a very famous sculptor, Andy Goldsworthy, uh, who is uh, installed at the National Gallery of Art to design a sculpture. He's been working on it for a few years now and that should be installed uh, in sometime soon at Oak Hill. I think that will be a, um, a real calling card. I think it'll be a draw for people to come and see the Andy Goldsworthy statue, um, uh, sculpture. Uh, <clears throat> a friend who lost his son uh, collects a Rodin sculpture. And he had talked about perhaps installing a Rodin at Oak Hill. Um, I think he's moved away from that, but um, uh, Oak Hill, uh, is um, a very beautiful place. Uh, when we rebuilt the um, steps below the Corcoran temple that we showed earlier, that goes, the steps go down to the carriage house. Um, we built a communal plaza um, where uh, ashes could be uh, put into a communal vault um, and the name inscribed on a ledger stone nearby. And I had a friend in, Georgetown named John Dreyfus have a friend. Um, John's a very talented sculptor. Maybe some of you know his work. Um, he's got the baseball players outside of the Federal Reserve building downtown um, and many other installations uh, around town. Uh, so we purchased a, a John Dreyfus sculpture and installed it on that plaza. So I don't think we can do that all the time. I don't think we can do it everywhere, but I think it's appropriate to have beautiful sculpture, funerary sculpture and uh, appropriate sculpture. We do reserve the right to approve um, monuments, inscriptions. One of the most irreverent in, that, that is in Oak Hill, and it was not on my watch, but there was a couple from Bethesda who were buried, are buried at Oak Hill, and their inscription reads, we finally found a place to park in Georgetown. So um, anyway, um, all stripes and sizes and types, and, but tastefully done, we hope. Yeah, definitely. Um, thinking a little bit about the people who are buried um, at Oak Hill, someone's wondering, um, how long the cemetery existed before it was open to burials by people of color, of people of color? 
I don't know the answer to that question. I, obviously, like many other institutions, um, we have a neighbor, Mount Zion Cemetery and the Female Union Band Society, uh, which are next to us, uh, separated by Mill Road. Um, the, uh, Mount Zion, as it's called, um, is older than Oak Hill and was probably started in the 1820s or so and was a burial place for persons of color as well as white. Uh, when Oak Hill opened in the 1849-ish, um, I think many of those, some of those uh, white residents were moved to Oak Hill. Um, I don't know what the condition of Mount Zion was then, but it fell into terrible disrepair in the 1950s. Um, the city closed it, refused to allow uh, more burials there. There was vandalism, there was theft of stones, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, several real estate developers tried to buy that property in the 60s and there were court battles and eventually that was not allowed. Uh, recently, uh, the uh, District of Columbia has given them several hundred thousand dollars. Uh, a friend of ours, Adderbridge Horsey, is the architect who is helping them repurpose that landscape to restore the stones. Uh, there's been pretty extensive tree work done there. Ground penetrating radar has uh, been performed there. There are several thousand people buried at uh, Mount Zion and very few of them have headstones. Um, I am working, um, have been working, have talked to Mount Zion for the last four or five years. Uh, Neville Waters is really the gentleman in charge of that uh, cemetery and their foundation, but they don't have the income stream that we do. And I have a scheme to help Oak Hill and Mount Zion and uh, perhaps uh, we can do a joint project that will uh, help both of us and help them in particular to have um, some income in the future. I'd like to see that. Uh, several years ago, all of our board members made contributions to Mount Zion Cemetery as well on a personal level, not with cemetery money. Yeah, Tudor Place has also collaborated and, and partnered with Mount Zion in the past, especially on their landscaping projects. Um, uh, Mount Zion has a receiving vault, um, a brick structure on the back of the property that was also part of the Underground Railroad, so is the story. And so there's a rich history that needs to be preserved at Mount Zion. Yeah. Um, kind of keep your uh, question. So recently, um, uh, Peggy Cooper Kafritz was buried at Oak Hill, Vernon Jordan was recently interred at Oak Hill. And so Mount uh, uh, Oak Hill was never denominational, but I'm sure it had a, a, a policy of, uh, I, I doubt anyone asked because they knew the answer would be no uh, as to colored burials at Oak Hill for a very long time. Um, kind of continuing to think about the people at Oak Hill, uh, we, have, we have a comment that asks, would you comment on the Carroll family mausoleum, um, the Lincoln connection and the challenge presented by surges of interest and visitation um, as came after the novel Lincoln and the Bardo and the Mark now present could there. You, could you say that second part of the question again? Um, the challenge presented by surges of interest and visitation as came after the novel Lincoln and the Bardo um, and the Mark now present there. I don't think the surges of interest were a challenge except that uh, we were always worried for safety. The, the Carroll Mausoleum is in the far northwest corner near the Peters, near the Lintica Mausoleum. And it's an area that has not received a lot of attention in terms of rebuilding the pathways or the staircases. And our only worry was that people would get to and from safely or that they would find it at all because it's, you know, it's a bit of a hike to get down the hill and over there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we welcome the surge of interest. Um, for those of you who don't know the history, um, Carol was the clerk of the Supreme Court. And when uh, Abraham Lincoln's son, Willie, died of typhoid fever at the age of 12 in 1862 or three, um, Carol said, Mr. Lincoln, would you um, need to use the Carol Mausoleum to inter Willie until you finish your second term? And 
Willie Lincoln had been embalmed, I hope this isn't too graphic, um, with a um, process called French embalming that basically turned his little body into uh, alabaster marble. Um, and Lincoln used to ride his pony by himself. Remember Lincoln was a very tall gentleman and probably had a very little pony. Um, up to Oak Hill, he would tether the pony uh, with the superintendent and would walk down to the Carroll Mausoleum by himself. This was in the days before Secret Service. And he would open the casket and hold Willie Lincoln's body in his arms. Uh, Mary Todd Lincoln never came to Oak Hill. She was, as we know, overcome by grief. But Lincoln visited um, little Willie for his favorite child, perhaps, uh, for a long period of time. And I think quite regularly. <laughs> um, so when um, George Saunders wrote Lincoln and the Bardo, it was about the, 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 the period of time and the, the place between heaven and have, between heaven and earth, uh, the bardo is a Sanskrit word for um, that nether region, that ephemeral area. But when you're not quite uh, admitted to heaven, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and um, that uh, that was where Willie Lincoln um, was residing when when his father tried to uh, reach him, talk to him. Uh, be in his presence. And so <clears throat> George Saunders wrote this brilliant book, which won the Man Booker Prize in England, uh, one of the most prestigious prizes of English literature. And uh, he spoke at Georgetown. I got to sit to, next to him at dinner for an hour. He was just a fascinating, fascinating person. I really look forward to his next book. Um, he couched the book at Oak Hill, and, and um, it was the story of uh, the Carroll Mausoleum and uh, President Lincoln coming to visit his dead son. And um, the other side story is that um, the um, president of the Confederacy's son, Benjamin, was buried at Oak Hill temporarily also. When Lincoln was assassinated, obviously, in 63, his um, body was taken by the train to New York for uh, a visitation, for observation, for uh, remembrance, and then um, taken to Springfield, Illinois. And there is a very mournful picture of Abraham Lincoln's seven-foot casket on that train and Willie Lincoln's next to him, which was obviously the casket of a child. It's a very moving picture. Um, and so the president of the Confederacy's son also died from an accident and was buried at Oak Hill for several years before he was removed to Hollywood Cemetery with his father, uh, where they reside now. Cemeteries are such places of stories. You can talk about so many people who, who yes, have lived there, there and also are buried there. There are about 20,000 stories that one can tell uh, about, uh, about Oak Hill, yes. Yeah. We have one final question in the chat um, asking if you could tell us about the Tiffany designed monument. Um, the Tiffany stone, that large monumental stone near the Montrose Park fence, um, was uh, purchased for the Spencer family. Spencer was the president of the Southern Railroad when it was located in Washington, D.C., in the Southern Building at, uh, on 15th Street. And uh, the Southern Railroad was obviously one of the major railroads in the United States and was headquartered in D.C. until it moved to New York and then merged with Burlington Northern or some other, uh, Norfolk Southern, sorry. Um, and the Spencer family um, uh, purchased the stone from the studio of Lewis Comfort Tiffany. I made the comment recently that it was the only funerary stone um, and I was um, educated that it was not the only funerary stone that the studio of Lewis Comfort Tiffany did. Tiffany is buried at Greenwood Cemetery in uh, Brooklyn where some of my other family are buried. Um, but uh, it's a beautiful piece, and um, you, there are half a dozen or more um, tablet stones in front of it, which are the Spencer family. 
Thank you. I, I think that's all the comments we have in the chat. I'll give folks a moment to, to ask any final ones. And while I do that, I would just like to know if, if our visitors today, our attendees today visit Oak Hill, what do you think they will find most surprising about, about the cemetery or their visit? Um, I'm not sure I'd use the word surprising. Um, it is a very beautiful place. Um, there's wildlife with foxes and too many deer and beautiful birds, lots of squirrels. Um, there are fish in the Rock Creek. I saw some shad coming upstream to spawn a year or two ago. Um, uh, ducks, I saw some ducks down there this morning. Uh, I think I saw a beaver. Yeah, I did see a beaver there um, right at the foot of Oak Hill uh, uh, a couple of years ago. I haven't seen him recently. Uh, probably went upstream to make his dam. Um, but there's just a lot going on with nature. We have a couple of beehives at Oak Hill. Um, the plants, the trees are spectacular. It, the surprising thing is that it changes so much from spring, fall, summer. Um, there's just always a lot going on. Uh, Dave Jackson, our former superintendent who recently retired, when, I, when we hired him, um, I said, Dave, this is just a sleepy little cemetery, nothing going on here. And then we've got the fence projects, we've got road rebuilding, we're building columbaria, and um, we're doing a lot of historic research, uh, genealogical research. We're performing about 50 funerals a year. Um, we're selling um, lots of um, burial plots. People are planning it. One good thing about last year was that um, only one person, as far as I know, a uh, woman about 75 years old died from COVID and was buried at Oak Hill. And then I think in December, a couple in their 80s or 90s died with COVID related symptoms and uh, were buried at Oak Hill, but very, very few. I have a map in my office downtown, which shows the deaths from the influenza epidemic of pandemic of uh, the 19, late 1918, 1919. And there were many, many people who died at, uh, in Georgetown and are buried at Oak Hill. And if you look at many of them children, and if you look at, uh, <clears throat> at Oak Hill and the burial dates, you'll see that the, the epidemic, the pandemic back then was, was far, far worse in terms of death. Uh, fortunately, we haven't seen that. Nothing happened at Oak Hill last year. Um, people didn't plan. People didn't need to buy burial space. And then two families in December, one of whom the middle family said, well, gosh, Oak Hill must need our help. Let's purchase some mausoleums. And we did about a million dollars worth of revenue, over a million dollars worth of revenue in December. And then nothing happened in January and February. And then I think it was March or April, people decided, oh, time to go um, you know, make our plans at Oak Hill again. And so we've had uh, in the last year or 18 months, um, we've had extraordinary um, response to, people have been very generous. Our investment portfolio has done very well, thank you. And um, people have purchased a lot of um, burial plots at Oak Hill. So I think maybe the pandemic made people think about um, where they want it to be in the future. So. Mm -hmm. All sorts of surprising outcomes. Oh, we have we have one last late late question in our chat. Can you talk about the new tree plantings? I'm sorry, the what? Uh, new tree plantings. Tree planting. Um, four or five years ago, we uh, made a partnership with Casey Trees and uh, planted sort of two dozen trees. Uh, two years later they came back and planted another two dozen or so trees. I think we're around 50 trees that they have planted. Um, Oak Hill has some mighty stately old oaks and some of them are 100, you can see from the, uh, from the photograph, uh, some of them are 150 years old or so and they're reaching their uh, expiration date. Uh, they're expensive to uh, remove, and we hope that they don't fall on monuments or people or our staff, et cetera, et cetera. So we've spent a lot of money on tree maintenance. Uh, I would guess we spent $100,000 in the last year or two on, on tree maintenance. Um, it helps extend the lives of trees to prune them and um, uh, take care of them. We haven't really had to 
cable them or, or whatever. We've done a lot of limbing. And um, one of my favorite tree stories at Oak Hill was, I think when I first started, there was a, uh, a dead oak tree that was 120 feet tall or so. And it was just straight up. There were no limbs. And everyone who came to see it said, oh, no, it's a widow maker. We, we don't want to take that one down. You get, get somebody else. And a fellow came and said, well, I'm going to I'm going to fly a Chinook helicopter in from California and we'll cut it and lift it out and drop it onto our street and then we can move it and chop it up. And that'll be $75,000. I said, I don't think so. So I'd like to say we got a fellow from West Virginia for $3,000 and a six pack of beer and uh, we safely removed the train. So. And, and no helicopters in Georgetown at that point. Yeah. Uh, Casey Trees, and rightly so, wants to replace, you know, old oak trees with new oak trees. And trees, you know, root jack monuments, the fence, buildings. And so we have to be careful about how big a new tree we can or should or where. And um, so I don't think they want us just to put redbud trees in or azaleas or or uh, dogwoods. So um, we have a conversation with them from time to time. I think we'll, we'll ask them to come back in another year or so. And we've taken out some big trees. And we've had to take out some big trees. Some have fallen, died. A very, very large one fell next to the Carroll Mausoleum a month or two ago. I mean, fortunately, it fell down towards Rock Creek. But um, uh, we will replace trees. We want to be known as Oak Hill. Well, thank you so much for talking with us and, and talking uh, about Oak Hill for us today. Um, I'm going to give Mark an opportunity to share any anything he wants to share, um, but thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, George. And uh, maybe you could share your contact information for the, the $3,000 and six pack of beer tree removal person. We could probably <laughs> use them here. But um, I do want to let people know about a couple of things that are coming up here at Tudor Place on Thursday evening, it's the return of Tudor Nights on site. So Coco, Colonialism, and the Chocolate Pots of Tudor Place. And so you'll learn about the long history of chocolate and how that's reflected in the collection here. And you'll have a chance to uh, have a, a sample of American Heritage Hot Chocolate. And again, that's an on-site event that, uh, that we're doing here. This is an event for members only. So if you are not currently a member of, of Tudor Place, we certainly would encourage you to, uh, encourage you to, to do that. I'm uh, uh, attempting to post the, the link here to our membership page so you can find out more about becoming a member of, of Tudor Place. And so you participate in things like Tudor Nights that's coming up later this week. And our final landmark lecture of the series this year will be on November 16th where uh, Jerry McCoy, the librarian from Special Collections at the Georgetown branch in the library, will take us on a virtual tour of Georgetown to see the residents and landscapes depicted in the artwork from the Peabody Room at the library. So that is on November 16th at 6.30. You can find out more about this and other events at Tudor Place at our website, tutorplace.org. So you can uh, find out more and sign up. Again, George, thank you very much, Laura. Thank you for your help this evening. Katie, thank you for uh, uh, thank you for putting all of this together, and thank you to all of you for joining us for the fifth lecture in our lecture series this year. So great to see all of you. Hope to see you again soon. Drive safely.